Well, hello friends, so glad that you have joined us for this webinar, Matters of the Heart, around sex, love, and intimacy. For those of you who may have uh, registered several days ago, thank you for uh, being patient and putting up with the power and internet outages here in Texas. But I am also glad that this has allowed many more of you to register and join that had originally been registered when we had this scheduled for Tuesday. So everything is working out beautifully and I am so grateful that you have joined us. I have seen many of you already mentioned in the chat where you're coming from around the country. I know we have people who are registered for this webinar even from around the world. I'm not gonna be able to say hi to each one of you, but thank you for joining us. This matters of the heart. It is a big deal. Um, if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll do my best to uh, respond at the end. Uh, know also that uh, if you have uh, issues with connection or whatever, we will be making a replay available of this to those of you who are joining us. It is just really, really great to have you here. So matters of the heart around sex, love, and intimacy. I hear literally every single day from people who are wrestling with issues around sexuality, men and women, married and single, young and older, people from across the country and from literally around the world who are wrestling with this. And after hearing from and talking with, uh, oh, it, it, it's thousands of people now. I have seen over and over again that it's not primarily about behavior. It's primarily about matters of the heart. So much of what you have likely heard if you've been in church, and I, I, I would guess that most of you have been in church uh, for some part of your life, and, and that's, that's why you're here, uh, but most of what you likely have heard in church is primarily about behavior. It's what's right and wrong, what is sin and what's not sin, and try and wrestling with that list of do's and don'ts. Uh, but that misses so much of what's under the surface. And has that really been working for you? If you've been trying to live that out, live out the, the do's and don'ts, uh, has it really been working for you? Yes, behaviors do have consequences. But much more than outward behaviors, it's what's going on in the heart. Even Jesus said that out of the heart is where all these behaviors come from. Uh, love sex or hate it. The issue of sex affects you deeply. I don't know that there are many other areas that cut as close to the core of who we are as human beings than the area of sexuality. Now, Sexuality is not the sum total of who you are as a human being. Jesus doesn't first see you in relation to your sexuality. He first sees you as his child. But this issue gets very close to the core of who we are. And regardless of your relationship status, regardless of what your sexual drives are, regardless of who you're attracted to, regardless of what may have happened to you, regardless of what you've done or not done when it comes to, to sex and related things. A moral formula and list of do's and don'ts, it just doesn't work. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably heard the story of how it's supposed to be. A boy meets girl, they fall in love, they have sex for the first time on their wedding night and it is wonderful and Thereafter, they have an unending, sexually blissful relationship. But sadly, that doesn't happen a lot. You may also have heard the story in culture that sex and sexuality is just whatever feels good. Just, j just do it. it. It's a biological need. And if you've tried that, you may realize that that's not working either. So regardless of what stories you have lived, 
you need a way to deal with all your story. And do's and don'ts don't cut it. That's why we are getting to matters of the heart. Most likely, you came to this webinar because you are struggling, you're wrestling in some way with what's going on in your heart around sex and sexuality. Maybe you are a young person who is struggling with how do I deal with the sexual drives I am feeling as a Christian not being married? What do I do with that? Maybe you are married and there is no intimacy between you and your spouse. Things just are not going well and you're feeling, you know, frustration or loneliness or anger, resentment. I mean, that is just, it's just a mess. Maybe you're hooked on pornography. Maybe you find yourself going from one sexual relationship to another and you know you should try and stop and, you, and you've tried. Maybe you've even prayed about it and it's just not working. You're, you're not stopping the behavior that you know is harmful to you. Maybe you are struggling with same-sex attraction. And how do you, culture says it's okay. You pr may have heard in church that it, it's really not. And how do you deal with that as a follower of Jesus? Maybe you hate sex and you have just built walls around your soul that are closing you off from intimacy, first of all, with yourself, with others, and, and with God, and, and there's just no crossing that barrier. If any of those apply or anything related, you are in the right place. We're gonna address those things. You may also love someone who is struggling with those kinds of challenges. Maybe you're a Christian leader who would like to just address this a, a little more deeply and thoughtfully, because you want to better help others who are wrestling with these kinds of issues. So if you have been frustrated at trying to figure out what's right or wrong when it comes to sex, if your feelings of frustration or loneliness or uh, just confusion around this area, if it's just not working, if there has been a disconnect between some part of your sex life and your relationship with God, and you just can't seem to make those two things come together, you are in the right place. Those are the things that we are going to be addressing in our webinar, Matters of the Heart. Now, in just a few minutes, I am going to introduce you to my friend, Lori Krieg. Lori is an author, a speaker. She is the host of Hole in My Heart podcast, and she is passionate about helping Jesus followers live out a gospel-centered approach to sexuality. Lori and her husband, Matt, Lori and Matt Krieg, have co-written a book, An Impossible Marriage. It's raw, it's authentic, and it is full of Jesus. We have four of these books to give away free, just, just four. We don't have, unfortunately, enough for everybody, but we do have four. If you stay on till the end of the webinar, I will show you how you can be entered to win one of our free copies of Matt and Lori Krieg's book, An Impossible Marriage. And I will be introducing her to you in just a moment. She and I together are going to have a conversation about these matters of the heart. Now, before we actually bring Lori on, I want to know a little bit about you. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions. We're talking about sex and love and intimacy. So first of all, how satisfied are you with the state of your sex life? Are you quite satisfied? Uh, just so-so or not at all, maybe unsure. Now. I cannot link your answer to you. I don't know what you individually are answered. I can't link your answer to your email address. So this is anonymous. I just want to get a flavor of those of you who are here on our webinar this evening. So how satisfied are you with the state of your sex life? And I see a number of you um, who are clicking and answering that uh, Whole question I'm just going to give an, another moment or two and then we'll we'll look at the results okay let's see what you answered 
Oh, most of you are not satisfied. A few of you are, some are, are partially satisfied, but a good half of you are not at all satisfied with your sex life. So there's good reason for you to be here. We're dealing with those matters of the heart. Now, here's another question. Based on what you know already, how healthy or mature are your attitudes, feelings, beliefs, and so on around sex and sexuality? based on what you already know. Again, your answers are anonymous. Just want to get a flavor of, of who we're talking to um, this evening. So uh, how healthy or mature do you feel like your beliefs, attitudes uh, are around sex and sexuality? Uh, quite mature and healthy, just so-so, quite, quite unhealthy. Maybe you're not even maybe kind, of, kind of unsure. Uh, Again, several of you are responding and, and glad that you are. Okay, let's see what you said. Um, over half of you said that your attitudes uh, and beliefs are mature and healthy. Um, some just so-so or quite unhealthy. I'm thinking that that indicates uh, in your head, things are doing fairly good for, for most of you, but you're not satisfied. The heart level is anything but. Uh, one more before I bring on my friend Lori Creek. We're talking about sex, love, and intimacy. That is about relationships. That is connecting. So how able are you to regularly connect deeply with others and with God at an authentic level? That uh, heart to heart, that kind of deep connection. How well are you able to do that? Um, again, a number of you are responding and we'll just give another moment or two for the others of you to be, uh, when, again, these, these matters of the heart, that is really what determines the quality of your connection with others and your connection with God. So often in the church, we have separated sexuality and relationship with God. You'll hear as Lori Creek and I talk about this, that they're a lot more connected than most of us believe, not in a sense of behaviors, but in a sense of matters of the heart. Okay. Let's see what you said. Um, Okay, um, a, a number of you are regularly able to connect deeply and authentically with others, and most of the rest of you just, just every now and then. There is so much here that I believe can be fruitful. So I want to bring on and introduce to you my friend, Lori Krieg. She is just passionate about these very things matters in the heart. So give me just a moment. I'm going to adjust the camera so we, we, you, can, you can see us both uh, and I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Lori Krieg, thank you for joining us. It's really great to have you with us today. I know you and I share some deep places in our hearts about what we're talking about today and just welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So glad to be with you and everyone watching. Yeah. We are talking about matters of the heart when it comes to sex and sexuality and intimacy. And mm -hmm. I know that area is, it, it's been part of your life. It's part of the ministry that you are, God is empowering you to share now. This is such a big deal for so many people today. Maybe for those who don't know you, uh, just start by telling a little bit of how you came to this, a little bit of your own story around this area. Yeah, definitely. The intersection of the heart and sexuality yes. is critical. It's so critical. And I think not many of us are taught that there is a connection. Um, you know, growing up, I think hearing things like your, about your heart, even growing up in the church and an amazing Christian family, 
I was, I never, um, I maybe understood like God will give you the desires of your heart. And so I was very confused when in college here, I was this Christian girl who loved Jesus the most, like the best she knew how, you know, yeah. <laughs> like I'm going to live a double life and this is fake. You're never, you don't realize like, it's not the deepest places of your heart. So I was like, oh, you said small groups. You said double life there. That just, mm -hmm. just that phrase really just, wow. Yeah. So in college, I was leading small groups, leading worship at our church. My dad was a pastor and yeah, I had this secret same sex relationship with another girl who was also a Christian. And it wasn't like I even intentionally like met her and I was like, oh, I'm going to start a relationship. It was, I had felt these attractions toward the same sex my whole life, but it wasn't like, I was like, oh, this is a version of broken sexuality that I have to surrender to the Lordship of Christ, just like everyone else is called to do. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to homosexuality, that was very other. And the disconnect that just even in that snapshot of what you've given, the disconnect between what the church says and what you hear, you know, God is saying about all of this, and then the matters in your own heart, that, that split, uh, what was that like for you to live with? It, it really felt like fragmentation. Yeah. It felt like I felt this growing up but overhearing Christian culture wars, for lack of a better term, like mm -hmm. this war on marriage and this homosexual agenda that's going to like destroy the church. Like I, I love Jesus. I love my family. I love the church. I didn't want to destroy the church. And so it wasn't even, a, it wasn't even, it was like categorically non-sin because it was so sinful. So it wasn't like good Christian sin. It was like terrible. And so I'd have to fragment myself in order to cope. And so here I was in college and I, I wasn't fragmenting anymore. And yet I was living this double life. Cause I didn't feel like I could talk about this relationship with anyone inside the church, because in those early two thousands days, the church was becoming more open with sharing about things like heterosexual pornography addiction, yeah. but out of the same mouths of pastors who would confess their own addiction to heterosexual pornography or even affairs would become, would come words of vitriol for my version of broken sexuality. So I was like, this isn't safe. And I needed somewhere to turn. And I uh, met a therapist uh, who I went to see for my depression, who really um, helped to connect my heart and these desires I had. Yeah. You've said uh, your version of broken sexuality and I'm one who believes that we all have different versions of our, our broken sexuality. I also grew up in a, a Christian home and heard the standard, you know, message, you know, sex is for marriage. And if you save yourself for marriage, it's, it's going to be great. But there was a lot of dysfunction, enormous dysfunction in my family. And the way I responded was just to shut down. I built walls around my heart. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a doctor. I achieved academically, but I was just a, I was a closed off person and, um, you know, dated rarely, but there was just, there was just no ability for, for me to connect at all. And as God brought me through my, um, you know, PTSD and depression and anxiety and, and all of that. I dealt with a lot of those things in my heart. And then when God did bring my husband into my life, I was in my forties already. And I had to do some deep work in my own heart about this area, sex, sexuality, and intimacy. If I was ever going to have the kind of relationship I knew God wanted uh, with my husband. Now, you, Lori, you're married, and with what you've already shared about your story, some people might say, well, how could that ever be? So let's continue. How did, how did marriage come to be for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to get married at all. Like, even like putting the same-sex desires aside, I, I just thought everyone was kind of lying even in the Christian faith, when they were saying like, oh yeah, our marriage is good. I was like, yeah. she hates, she hates you. You resent her. This is a sham. <laughs> like, honestly, it just felt like, 
marriage didn't look good. And then I had this disconnect in my own heart. So when I went and saw, um, her name was Carolyn, uh, uh, for the depression, I talked with her also about these attractions to the same sex and she treated me so different than I thought I would be treated and treated me differently than other therapists had. Um, There was some good that I had seen, but she didn't try and make me straight. She tried to connect my sexuality to the good needs in my heart. Here's how. (sighs) Lori, Lori, when you are envisioning the ideal perfect woman in your head, what are you picturing? I was like, that's awkward. I'm not gonna tell you what I'm seeing. But I was so shocked that the words that came tumbling out of my mouth were not sexual in nature. They were heart words. I want to be seen and known and loved as I am. And she stooped down and looked in my eyes because I felt so much shame and seeing someone remove shame. Lori, those are not bad things. You're just looking to the wrong place. Now, the right place was not a dude. The right place was the Lord. And I was like, don't even tell me it's Jesus because I'm already like a super Christian. So if you go ahead and say, well, you just need Jesus, I'm going to be super annoyed. The answer, of course, was Jesus. But I didn't realize those good needs to be seen and known and loved, those good needs, that I had barriers between those and the experiencing the need meter of my soul. I had at some level, but I didn't know that I had barriers like my own trauma. I had lies I was believing, shame, shame even from about feeling attraction to the same sex, this self-hatred. And so she helped to remove some of those barriers between the needs in my heart, good needs in my heart and the need meter of my soul. So I could experience God there. And that empowered me. Like it says in Ephesians three, then you may know that filled me with God's love Yeah, and love does a million trillion things. But the thing that I was so grateful for, and I'm still grateful for to this day is it says, may you know this love though, though it is so great. You'll never fully understand it, but then you'll be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Love empowers us to die to self. Mm. And so God's love empowered me not to become straight. I, I still experience attractions to the same sex. So I had these good needs in my heart, but all of these barriers between these good needs to be seen and known and loved and the need meter of my soul, need meter, capital N, capital M, which is Jesus. And so these barriers are things like my own trauma or my own uh, lies I was believing. And Carolyn, utilizing spiritual disciplines like lament, and listening prayer and confession without shame and self-hatred of actual sin, not struggling with sin. And that helped to remove some of those barriers. And that made way that carved a space between God and my, those, that my whole riddled heart, uh, for his love. Yeah. And Ephesians three, you might, you probably know these verses. Hopefully those in the audience know it, you know, where it's the parts where it's like the height, the breadth, the depth of God's love. And Paul says, may you know this love though it is so great. You will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. God's love empowers us not to become straight. Like that's a boring, dumb goal. God's love (laughs) empowers us to die to self uh, daily, to take up our cross daily and follow him. Mm. You said a couple things there that are so powerful. You mentioned shame that you were carrying around all of this. And it makes me think of, you know, back to Genesis, Genesis 2, when the man and the woman were naked and unashamed and The Hebrew there, I believe, is very picturesque. It's not only no clothes on their body, but no walls around their heart, nothing between them emotionally or or spiritually. And yet they felt no shame. I don't think any of us humans know what that's like, uh, Mm. just in the natural, you know, naturally to be completely um, uncovered and feel no shame. Of course, the first thing that Adam and Eve do when sin comes is is they hide. And we've been hiding ever since. We We build walls of of shame around that and I love how you talk about Jesus love you know just burrowing through that it's not so much about a list of behaviors do's and don'ts 
it's getting to that need for intimacy and, and related needs that God built us with. That's how he created us. Yep. I love it. Uh, so what were some of the things that you discovered and that in talking with others, walking through their sexual brokenness, whether it's same sex attraction or anything else, these, these holes in our heart, that's what you call your podcast. And, and I love that. Um, talk about what some of those holes are. Yeah. So I really just think, you know, if we think about where I got the idea, some of it, you know, you read in Ecclesiastes about how our, our hearts are made for eternity or Paul alludes to in Athens and Acts 17, how he's like, how God's purpose was for us to like seek and search uh, for him. It's this longing we have. And St. Augustine said, you made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. And so we all feel this incompleteness. And I'm sure those of you who are watching have said sentences, maybe even during this uh, season, you know, we're in this forever long pandemic season, but hopefully by the time you're watching this, maybe it'll be done. Um, but we've said things like, if only, yes. or if only this was done, or at least I have, you know, this thing, or once I have that thing, every time we start a sentence with those beginnings, the next words are idols. So it's so good to say, okay, well, if only I have this or that, once I get that, but once we get the thing, the trip to Disney, the new car, the new house, the pandemic's done, we're still gonna feel this aching need. But instead of shaming that and being like, oh, I'm so stupid, I just need Jesus. Just, okay, what is it about that thing? What's it saying about your real need? So I am, all right, I just want the pandemic to get done. Why? Yeah. What's what's the good thing underneath that is I need rest. I need to be seen. I, I need to feel like I belong with people again, this isolation we feel. So the hole in our heart is really just incompleteness without God. And it's usually instead of being like, well, what do I actually need? It's really even good to look at what am I running toward? What are the idols of my heart right now? And then again, instead of shaming them, look underneath it and then confess, God, it's you, you can, can you give me rest today? Whether or not my circumstances ever change, mm. God, do I belong with you today? Are there people I cannot look to, but through to you who I, be, that I can feel this belonging with you. So the holes in our heart is just really incompleteness without God. We are all running to different idols, but really let's look underneath another layer to what's the good need of our heart that tells us it literally are the good needs of our heart, write the prescription for how we need God that day. Mm. Powerful. I can think of so many, if onlys things I hear from people that uh, are, are, are writing or, or talking to me. If, if only my spouse would have sex with me, if only I didn't feel this pull toward porn, um, if only my spouse would give me sex, then I wouldn't have to go to port, which is a lie. It's just all, all those, if only even around the topic that we're focusing on right now today around uh, sex, sexuality, and intimacy, if only this other thing were there, then I, I would be fulfilled. Go, going to right. someplace else um, to, to deal with those matters of the heart. Um, now, when you married Matt, I, I don't want to, to pass over this part that, that I know in your story. When you married Matt, like you said, it, it wasn't a dude who was uh, answering it, who you were connecting with. It, it was Matt. God called you to marry Matt. And yet he had issues too. So uh, what's up with that? Talk a little bit about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And just to answer some of the question of the elephant in the room, after I had that love connection with God, I was like, oh my goodness, I love you. I want to serve you. And how how do you want me to do that? And he said, I have someone for you. And I was like, no, but he didn't call everyone like me to marriage. He just said, Lori, dear one, the mode I want you to do the mission to make disciples is as a married woman. Mm. Not everyone like me. It's Lori. You're, I, I, this is the best. I know how to bless you and the world the best and sanctify you the best. And, and Matt, as a result, uh, so he called me not to marry all of men, all men, but right. one man, Matt. So our hearts connected, then we put a ring on it and six years in, 
uh, you know, I was like, man, Matt is so different. He's such a man of integrity. I had all these biases. I really viewed men at, skeptically at, at best, uh, <laughs> especially when it came to pornography. I was like, they are all addicted to porn. They all struggle with lust. And, but I got a good one. I got a good one. I don't have to deal with that. Yeah, I got a good one. And um, six years in, Matt comes forward with his own porno secret pornography addiction that had been a chunk of our marriage, at least five years. And I was raging, Matt, you can imagine if I'm like, well, you're the one good one. And um, I was like, don't you know it promotes sex trafficking? Don't you bubbity bub? And it was about three days of asking a lot of questions. And to Matt's credit, it was repentance, repentance, confession. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. And there was a moment, dear friends, where I remember sitting on the floor, looking out over our deck and Matt sitting here, just his head and his hands. Mm. And I do this practice sometimes where I ask the Lord, God, what's your emotion about the situation? What do you, how do you feel about this? Cause I was so mad. I was like, God's probably mad. <laughs> and sure there was right. There was like some of that, but honestly, Matt was so repentant and God forgave him, but I sensed God's elation. Mm. I'm going to use this. And I was like, <laughs> okay, no, <laughs> but then I was like, how, how can, if that's God's heart, help me understand. And God took me to my heart. Lori, dear one, when you, you, you struggle with some stuff, don't you? And listen, I'm not like a one, a one note, Charlie, where I have only one issue, which is sexual brokenness. <laughs> I got lots of issues. <laughs> so we all, yeah, <laughs> let's just clarify. They're just a little more church acceptable, namely performance, people pleasing, but I run to those for the same reasons that I can run toward lust of whatever variety, but toward women for me, um, is cause I want to be seen and known and loved and applauded, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't want to get it from Jesus. You guys smile more if, with your face anyway. So Lori, what do you struggle with? Attraction toward women. Okay. What's Matt struggle with? Mm, but it's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is it is it Lori <laughs> so literally we run toward the same thing his was just through pornography and mine but mine's real life people okay Lori okay but then he goes, well, which okay, is worse Adam. if you want to think about it that way right. you know oh my word in some ways it is and so I mean that's it, a whole it, exactly it, it's yeah. not a, and I think that's uh -huh. part of the point none of this yeah. is worse we all we all uh -huh. have our brand of this and Jesus sees it, he knows it. And totally. But then this was the kicker that really deflated my rage. I There was still about a year of forgiveness that needed to happen. But he said, ask Matt why he turned toward pornography. Because he's a man and all men are lust monsters. Ask him, Lori, Matt, why did you run there? I really wanna know that I have value and that I'm seen and known and loved. Oh, wow. That, but this picture tells you in a not in an easy, you don't have, there's not a lot of cost to it way. It tells you just for a second that you have value yeah. and you feel it. Now the answer, just like my answer wasn't to run to men for my heart needs. Matt's answer wasn't to run to me. That's where we can have these issues. Well, if only, aren't I hot? Aren't I beautiful enough? Aren't I amazing enough? That's idolatry too. You can have idolatry in your marriage, guys. So Matt then went on a major journey of his own heart where he saw his own value in Jesus. And that's what has kept him to this day. Now we're pushing 12 years married. Um, to this day, he hasn't gone back to porn because he has, there's practical tools he put in place, but also he knows his value in Jesus Christ. Mm. Powerful. I know we have people watching who porn is their brand. Their, that, is, that is their particular struggle, men and women. Yeah. And to, to help to just get a picture that, that what you are going for, yeah, the, the sexual release may be there, but we're talking about matters of the heart. It's that desire to be seen and known and loved, um, that, that that is really the core. Now, um, 
Matt, your husband is a counselor. He deals with people who are struggling in these very issues in, in, in his office every day. And, and you speak and, and, and write as both of you in, in the, the various uh, connected ministry and then your individual ministries in this. What are you hearing from people about the, the struggle they have to get away from focusing only on behaviors, which yes, behaviors have consequences, mm -hmm. but getting past that and how hard it is to get to matters of the heart and what's needed mm -hmm. in making that journey. Yeah, you know, there's a couple layers. There's probably actually like 25, but two, two that I'll focus on are is that shame, that toxic shame. So I think that there is good, I hate using the word godly shame, uh, but toxic shame takes your back of your head and rubs your nose in what you've done. And it said, it's a whole body thing. You are worthless. Conviction, or maybe we could say godly shame is what you did was not worth it. And so there's a different, it's a pinprick. The Holy Spirit isn't like, you're worthless, that's stupid. We're image bearers. That's just, that's a total lie. It's what you did, dear one, this was not worth it. And so I think there's such a mishmash. And we, I didn't grow up understanding that. When I felt attraction to same sex, I was like, I hate myself. I dig my fingernails into my wrist. I, I hated everything about me. I, we aren't taught shame differentiation. We're not taught the difference between conviction and shame. We're taught, don't be bad. You're a bad girl. You're a yes. bad boy. You're a bad dog. So yes. be a good girl. So even, even the readjustment of language, even in our own house is, um, you are choose that you chose this bad thing. You are beloved. I love you, but you chose this bad thing. So I think we're not taught that language growing up. And so then we find ourselves at 10, 11, 12, addicted to porn or sleeping with someone at X number of years old yes. and we're attracted to the same sex. And we automatically go to, I feel worthless, but then you feel this. So then what makes you feel better? is going back to the very same thing you were just doing. So more porn makes you feel better, but then you're just uh, 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 until you need more alcohol, more whatever, right. and you, the hit has to get higher and higher. So I think I'm seeing that is like Carolyn did with me, like I try and do with my kids, like I try and do uh, with those I'm walking with is help them to feel seen. What did God do? And Adam and Eve felt that shame about themselves. He sought them out. Where are you? He said, yes. Yes. He didn't lose them in the garden. He's not dumb. <laughs> He's God. <laughs> he was seeking them out to see them in their mess and love them in their mess so that the power of shame could be removed from their messy situation. And I love, I'll just throw this on the shame part. Um, and then I'll do the second thing that could be the issue I'm seeing is God dealt differently in the garden with their nakedness. So they felt no shame at their nakedness. Then they sinned. Then they felt shame about their nakedness. Mm -hmm. God gave them clothes. Yes. He made clothes for them. He separately, he cared for, he didn't say, oh yeah, you are worthless. He's like, oh, you're feeling that way. Well, you shouldn't feel that way. He made them clothes. He cared for their bodies. And then he did deal with pinprick of their sin for that. You have to leave the garden. How, so, how, how kind to give them clothes mm. and then, you know, just take care of that. But then, yes, there, there exactly. are consequences and we'll deal with that. Yep. I love how God, that's, the, that's our model is to teach ourselves that and teach if God has given us kids or called us to be parents or disciple makers of any variety to teach disciple makers. We must teach those to those who we are discipling. I think a second thing that we're seeing as we're walking with people is not only are we not taught the differentiation between guilt and shame or godly shame and, you know, toxic shame, we're not taught heart words. Yes. Uh, Matt, Matt says in his counseling practice, like at least half of what he does is just helping people to feel internally. Um, stereotypically, this is maybe more men's issue but i think some of that is because we're not teaching men we're like oh be tough and cars and i don't know farting and sports as opposed to how do you feel i have to i'm in any i don't know if you're into the enneagram but like whatever if you look at it from a gospel perspective i'm a four and those are the ones who are like very internalized and we like to like poetry and be all blah. but so i'm a very um 
I like to introspect, but I have to ask my own soul, how are you doing? How mm -hmm. are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a huge thing. So instead of saying, ah, pandemic, mess, kids, wife, what feels better? Alcohol, porn, sex. I need sex. I need sex from you now. It's how am I feeling? I'm feeling angry. Yep. Okay. What's underneath the anger? I'm actually sad. Okay. Let's hang out with sad. What's sad? What's the sad about? Oh, I'm sad because of this. And that's actually kind of that. And that, so I think we have to teach ourselves and be taught uh, the shame thing and the, how, what are you actually feeling as opposed to going to these emotional painkillers real quick? Mm, so good. Um, on the Enneagram spectrum, I'm a, I'm a one, always trying to make things better and, and perform. And I have had to learn the same thing, to take time mm. to care for, tend to my heart as important, not yeah. only making the world better around me and performing myself better, you know, everything improving all the time, tending to my heart where it is right now yes. and, and paying attention there. It, it's not that you're, you're just navel gazing and, and diving into, into only yourself, but it's caring for that heart. Like, like Proverbs says, care for your heart with all diligence. That's where life comes from. Jesus talked about that all the time. Um, and in that light, there's, there's a, a, a word you've used a time or two, and I know you and Matt talk about this. And I think it's so important that we say this in this conversation and, and that's lament. When we are talking about the journey that Jesus has for us and, and the freedom and the joy and the forgiveness and the healing from shame, and we haven't even talked about the past, you know, what your sexual story may be about from the past, that it's real and it implies all of this. But as we talk about this, we are not implying that if you say yes to Jesus, every everything in life from that moment on is beautiful and there is never a problem, There there is never a challenge we still live this side of eternity. And how do we deal with the stuff that is still around us and in mm. us, frankly? Yeah, girl. So do, do you want me to engage how we do yes, that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so I have a sister right now who's going through some really intense medical stuff mm -hmm. and she's asking for help with, you know, making decisions on certain things. And I'm, I'm so caught if, if you guys can relate to this, just in the emotion of it, I'm like, I'm super mad mm -hmm. and I think I'm mad at God, but like, I know I'm not. And then I'm also very sad and then I'm also hungry. And then I'm, you know, it's like all these things <laughs> that I'm feeling and I know I'm like, I have to get all the crazy. And I say that with very tenderness and I love myself and I don't actually think that I am, but just all the noise, I need to get it out somewhere. And guess what? My husband is a licensed therapist and he is amazing. He can't handle all of this. Yeah. He can't, <laughs> neither can all my friends. Proverbs, I think it's 16, nine says, no, uh, or it's 15, nine. Each heart knows its own bitterness and no one can fully share in its joy. I read that this morning. That Did was you? part of my Bible reading this morning. Yes. That's hilarious. It basically is nobody gets you. <laughs> you it's you and Jesus friend, but that's the thing is the Lord. There's no empathy like Emmanuel's empathy. So when I'm feeling all this mess or you're like, I don't even know how I feel for me. The best way I do that is to get quiet. And I either picture a place in my head, like somewhere natural. Jesus got often went often away to the lonely places to pray. I have three little kids and a little puppy and a husband and a job. I can't go to like a mountain and like pray. I can sit down here though. And I can go quiet my mind and I can picture somewhere safe where I can hang out and I invite Jesus to be with me. Although I know he's always with me, but I try and picture him and I either journal or I write or I talk about how I am feeling. Now, sometimes I do this with friends and I'm like, I just need to figure out how I'm feeling. Big fan of therapy big fan of friendships, but when it's the total mess, there ain't no empathy like a manual's empathy. And it feels weird. It can feel wrong, but one quarter, at least a quarter, maybe a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament and imprecation. Imprecation is where David was like, smash the baby's heads on the rocks. And you're like, easy there, David, you're getting a little cray cray. He took it all, all of his emotions and took it to the Lord. And so how do I go and move on? And even 
even understand what my heart is feeling is I have to take the surface level ones. I'm mad about this. I'm angry about this. I'm sad about this, sad and fear. Then I know, and God, what do you believe about God? And I try and get to a place where I can under, I can hit like the rock bottom. Oh, that's actually what I'm feeling. Anger. That's a mask emotion usually for sadness or fear. So if I can get down to a place of either fear or sadness, and then even under that, if I can get to the raw place, what am I believing about God right now? And then I take that, God, what, what do you say? Who do you say I am? That raw base place that empowers me to go and love Matt, love my kids, love my sister, but then I can be a little bit more logical and functioning. <laughs> I love how you picture God is the place you take all this stuff. Mm -hmm. This is, this is real. And, and Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus felt this. I think we forget that Jesus is still human. He carries our human nature in himself and will for eternity. He mm -hmm. feels uh, it, it, it's not just an intellectual. Okay. I, I, I get you. Yeah. He gets us at, at the heart level, at the feeling level. He, he's been here and, and you can take this to him. Talk right. about, Laurie, um, as, as we kind of move toward the end of this part of our conversation, what that means with the sex, sexuality, and that brokenness and needs, very real needs. Um, mm -hmm. You and Matt talk about uh, submitting or consecrating your sexuality to Jesus. Yeah. And that's not only about behavior. We're talking about matters of the heart here and underneath that as the whole thing. Um, talk about what that has looked like in, in this context. I, I think bringing all this stuff to Jesus is, is so great a place where, where we need to go here. Yeah, so I, the more I've been in this sexuality biz, the more I'm seeing the critical need for looking inward into your heart with the Lord, like David did and like Jesus did as he... <laughs> Anyway, I just love how like after he hears John dies, he immediately gets a way to pray. You're like, he had some processing to do. Yes. So take and take it to the Lord. So we go inward, but we also look at, okay, God, what you made me. So like, if there were instructions on my side, cause I'm, I came in a box and called my mom, the instructions are, he, he knows how I can flourish the best. You know, if, if you bought some sort of mechanical equipment, like you bought a washer and dryer, you're like, yeah, I'm just not going to plug it in. I'm not going to actually use it the way it's supposed to. It's uh, I'm, I'm going to throw a toaster in it. No, you'd want to read what the maker wrote down about this so that you use it right. So my maker knows how I can flourish the best. God is not a sin Nazi. He, he's a flourishing champion. Yes. And so I, I understood that here. Mm -hmm. I understood the heart stuff. But then we need to get into the theological understanding, the theology of the body, if you will, yes. if you're a fan of Christopher yes, West. Yes, absolutely. John Paul II. Okay. Yep. Is that God didn't just go, oh, here's man and woman. Oh shoot, they're having sex. Oh my word. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. <laughs> gotta tell you, yeah. Lori, I, 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 I gotta tell you, when I was getting ready to be married and with all the family dysfunction and brokenness that I had, I, um, I went to the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, and I marinated in that for like six months. And when you read that Hebrew poetry, I mean, it's very sexy. It's very explicit. I mean, it, it's all there in the Bible. If you understand a little bit of the imagery, God really did invent this. I know, I know. but there was a time in our marriage, uh, which we write about in our book, um, which- More on this in a second. Is. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yep. The impossible marriage um, where I was like, I think God made a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And Matt's like, I was running a ministry focused on training the church on sexuality. And Matt's like, I think you're in the wrong business. <laughs> I was like, I'm just stating facts because I said, I could talk to someone for five whole minutes for one minute. And I could hear their story of sexual pain. Yeah. Uh, once you hit a certain age, it's just unreal yeah, at a minimum objectified at the worst, you know, extreme sexual trauma. Um, but then in addition, just the pain, like I said, when I didn't want to get married, I was like, everyone seems like they're living a joke. 
It's just this bid for sex. That's what marriage seems like. She wants his heart. He wants her body and they both resent each other. So I was like, I just don't think it's good. I think it's just jacked. Now uh, to borrow from Christopher West, which we're talking about, he writes theology of the body for beginners and yeah. along with other books, uh, our bodies tell God's story. But he, he says this line in there that Satan doesn't have his own clay. He's not a creator. God's the creator. And so for me, so Satan can twist and distort, but God created something good. So I had to go on not only a heart thing, not only, okay, I understand you're a flourishing champion thing. I had to understand why sex, why marriage, why male and female marriage? Like everything was on the table. And for me, it helped so much uh, to ask leaders hard questions, leaders who I respected, and then to read good books. For me, it was really helpful. Christopher West stuff was great. And then Francis and Lisa Chan's You and Me Forever. Um, of course, I'm a big Tim Keller fan, but here's what the Holy Spirit revealed to me as I was grilling him about <laughs> this, grilling him and my friends I bet. about this thing called sex. And why is it good is Ephesians 5. We've probably heard it 10 trillion times is I read it again and it made sense to me. The Holy Spirit opened up my eyes and my heart. And it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound or great or deep mystery. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. I was like, wait, the focus of these verses, I, I read it, heard it so inverted growing up. And this could have been just my misinterpretation. It was like, yes, men and women, you must be one, wink, wink, which I felt like the pastor was like, you guys just need to have lots of sex. I'm, and I'm like, okay, of course you are, male pastor. You're just trying exactly. to get more. And, and then it was like, oh yeah, something about Christ in the church. But it felt like men and women, we're the boss. We're the like model. And they'd be like, a Christ in the church, blah, 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 blah. Have a good day leave your tithe at the door. Yep. Uh, but it was like, wait, 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 Christ in the church. Okay. So there's so many jokes, how many, you know, jokes about men and women were so different. And I was like, I thought I was, I was like, yeah, why are you married? If you guys seem to hate each other so much men and they're farting and sports and blows loving and women <laughs> and target and yeah, lattes, I don't know, <laughs> leggings, um, men and women are very different. And yet God calls us to marriage, but how, if he calls us to marriage, it's male and female, but how different this mystery, this Christ in the church mystery, how different is God from humanity? Oh, wow. He is far above every ruler and power and authority. Not only, not only in this life, but the life to come, it says in Ephesians one, he, he lives in eternity. Isaiah says like he's, He's ontologically different. And yet he, the whole story of the Bible is he will marry us. And so that's the focus is very different. God wants to, and will marry us. And so if God has called us to marriage, he mm. has called very different men and women to die to self daily, to be one and therefore show the world a 24 seven gospel picture of how Jesus died to be one with us and how we are to die daily to experience increasing oneness with him. That's not how we're saved, but we need to keep dying so that we experience more of that union. Marriage is not a cosmic joke or a cosmic punishment. It is divine design. And then, so there's marriage. That was like light bulb. And I was like, okay, what's sex though? Okay. Right. What is sex in marriage? I was like, cause it just seems like all men just want to pardon, but get off. <laughs> and all women want is for men to get off them. And I'm stereotyping and that is not every scenario, but that's what I view. And I was like, wait a minute. No, no, no. God, Satan doesn't have his own clay. So this is a good thing, God. What are you trying to teach us here? And as I studied and as I understood, so if this is sex, the euphoric moment that you can experience through orgasm is a glimmer, is a glimmer of what we will experience in eternity. And it's not only going to be a physical experience, it's going to be mind, soul, body, spirit, this oneness. So when you have sex with your spouse, if God has called you to marriage, you are telling them God will be one with you holistically one day. And you are receiving that too. I will experience this in eternity, but times a trillion with God. Yeah. So to understand that there's a, there's a gospel picture 
as we give holistically to one That's another, right. it's not just a body thing. If we're doing it just bodily, we're not doing it right. No, this is a holistic thing. So I was like, wait a minute. So this, I get to tell Matt how much God loves him. And I get to be told that. And I get to receive a glimmer of what we'll experience in eternity. Yeah. I used to think sex was worthless. Now I cry about it. <laughs> it's with a gospel picture in a gospel picture. And um, that changed everything for me. Yeah. Beautiful. Powerful. You've said a couple times, if you're called to marriage, and I want to acknowledge that not everybody who's watching us is married, and God has not um, guaranteed that everybody will be married. Uh, we've, we've alluded to that, and I just want to be real honest about that. Um, now, since my husband passed away, I am living as an unmarried woman again, and I have had to learn to experience God as my husband as it says in Isaiah. And I believe that that applies to, to both men and women. It's part of the lament that we experience here in this life. And uh, I, I just don't want to ignore that very significant part of, of those who may be watching. Lori, how do you talk to uh, men or women who may not be married, who may not see marriage as an option or were and are not now and, and just, that that is not a physical reality for them at this season of their life, at least. Oh my word! I, I'm, I, we could probably I go love. for hours here, but I don't want to well, ignore this. Question. I'll do just. A, I'll try and keep it very short. I love single people so much because as we show you uh, a taste in man, my dying to self, we show you yes. a gospel picture in your dying to self and your future it's ex, you're looking ahead at eternity and living with this longing in your heart for jesus you show us a gospel picture of this oneness we can experience now and this oneness this this heavenly marriage that we will experience in eternity so i my single friends who are just bananas sanctified <laughs> like wow how they speak to jesus their union with him their marriage to him i mean paul says it's like he's like i mean essentially reading first corinthians 7 he's like so singleness is better but okay, he said, fine, really i married. wish you were like me meaning not married yeah. exactly <laughs> so i i get it there is some you gotta work on this a lot yeah. um but i just want to say your value is absolutely equal. I am so sorry how the church is, yes. uh, has viewed marriage yes. and sex and marriage as ultimate. It's an, we've made it an idol and it's garbage and I'm sorry. Correct. And we repent. I repent on behalf of the church. We need to see marriage and singleness as equally valuable modes. We do the mission to make disciples. And so we show you a gospel picture. You show us a gospel picture. So thank you and bless you. Mm. Thank you, Lori. At least we're just upfront about that. And, and, and that could be, that, that's a whole, that's a whole big piece on it on its own. I want you to just share for a moment about an impossible marriage. And for those of you watching, yeah, our, our giveaway is, is coming up. So don't, don't leave quite yet, but Lori, tell us about this. Yeah. So an impossible marriage is, a, is Matt and my story of some of the hardest years in our marriage and where I really learned and he learned this whole thing I just talked about and got teary eyed about, which is what is marriage and what's the purpose of sex in marriage. But it starts with me about uh, considering leaving. And then um, from Matt's perspective and his learning like, oh sure, I don't have porn in my life, but he still worships sex. And me, you know, I, I'm more, diminished sex. So our questions about what is marriage? Why is it male and female marriage? And then to what is uh, sex and purpose of sex in marriage? It's a story. And um, I, I don't know if you, <laughs> I don't think there's anything else like it exactly that, out there that, is what we keep hearing. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that is great. Um, story, your, your story. And for those of you watching, uh, all of you have a sexual story. We, we've alluded to that. A little bit. And so don't go anywhere. 
in just a moment, I'm going to share with you how you can get a copy of Lori's book. I'm also going to share with you our Sexpectations resource to help you walk through your sexual story. So we've got a great couple things yet to share with you. So stay with us. But thank you, Lori, for, for your transparency, your heart, your journey, for uh, demonstrating so much of uh, what Jesus does when he takes somebody who makes themselves available to him and all the, the good, the bad, and perhaps the ugly, he uses it all. So thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for leaning into these areas that are so important. Wow. I know when uh, you were listening to that, it's likely you recognize some things going on in your heart. Perhaps as you heard Lori Krieg and I talk about matters in the heart, you realize that your heart needs some tending. That scripture in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance for out of it are, is, is the wellspring of life. How well have you been tending your heart when it comes to matters of sex, sexuality, and, and intimacy. I want one final time to just uh, quickly get an idea from you. Uh, there, there we go. How well have you been tending your heart when it comes to this area? Quite well, um, maybe a little bit, not, not well at all, or maybe you're still unsure about tending your own heart in this area. Uh, again, your, your individual response is, is anonymous. But more than any other single thing that I hear there is that we have not been well taught or experienced in tending our hearts, perhaps especially in this heart issue of sex, love, and intimacy and we need to learn that as humans and as Jesus followers. Uh, I am going to uh, answer your questions in just a, a, a couple minutes so don't, don't go anywhere if, if you do have questions. So let's see what you are saying about tending your heart. A few of you quite well, most of you the largest number of you, a little bit, uh, a little, you're, you are tending your heart uh, partially. That was the, the, the majority response. And a, a not a small amount, about a third of you said, not tending your heart well at all. And still a few of you uh, not particularly sure uh, about how you're dealing with that. I promised you that I would tell you how you can get a cop, one of our uh, four free copies of Matt and Lori Krieg's book, An Impossible Marriage. You'll see right next to, uh, to me there, if, if you're watching this live, you'll see a link where you can find out more about the book, An Impossible Marriage. Uh, if you are watching this on a replay, please check the link in the description right under this video, we'll have a link about where you can find out more as well. But for those of you who are live, we have four of these free books to give away. And if you are still here on the webinar live, you are entered to win. Our, our system is putting a little check mark by your email address if you are still here live. We, we can check. Uh, that, that you are here live, and so you are being entered to win a copy of Matt and Lori's book, An Impossible Marriage. Uh, again, we can only make this available to those with a U.S. mailing address, so I, I'm sorry for those of you who may be watching from other parts of the world. We cannot send this out, out of the country because of how we got it and just, and, and just the details. So for U.S. mailing address, four of you will be able to, uh, to get a copy of this. And if you are a winner of one of those four copies, you will hear from us in the next oh, 24 to 48 hours or so and uh, send that your way. So I am really thrilled that we have a few of those to give away. Now... I want to share with you a few very practical steps about dealing with these matters 
in your heart. While Lori Krieg and I were talking, um, you heard a few of the steps that are important, but I want to get very, very practical with you and just for a couple minutes, show you some important uh, keys in addressing the matters in your heart. Now, yes, pray. And you have probably been praying. You may have desperately been crying out to God in this very area, but prayer by itself, as critical as it is, is not enough. If, especially if by prayer, you mean, oh God, please deliver me from porn so, don't, so I don't have any desire to go to porn again or please make my spouse want to have sex with me, or I'm a single person and please take my desire for sex away from me, or please bring me a spouse so I can have sex. If that kind of prayer is where you are going, it's not the whole story. Jesus invites it, but remember, we're talking about matters of the heart and almost always, Jesus is inviting you into a process as you deal with these issues. And that process is you and he working together to address these matters. It is critically important that you deal with your sexual stuff. You did not wake up this morning deciding to have sexual issues. You have a story and your story matters. There is stuff that happened to you and then you responded in certain ways, some of it perhaps having no idea what would happen or what you were actually, uh, the, the behaviors that you were actually planning. Sometimes you may have been knowingly acting in a, in a destructive way. All of that together goes into who you have become as a sexual person. Your sexual story matters and you've got to deal with that stuff. Jesus wants to be with you in dealing with your stuff. Lori Craig talked about Emmanuel, God with us. Remember when Jesus was here on earth, he met the woman at the well in Samaria. He is offering this woman living water and she wants it. Jesus says to her, go call your husband. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right, you don't. You have had five husbands and the person you're now with is not your husband, you, you said right. Just moments later, that woman runs back into the town and she tells everybody she meets, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Now, Jesus didn't give her a, uh, you know, her life flashing before her eyes in, in a moment or, you know, a quick video replay of, of everything. He put his finger on her stuff. And it wasn't in a condemning way. Not at all. It was Jesus saying, I see you. I, I get you. I, I see this. Now, let's deal with this. Let, let's deal with your stuff. That's what Jesus is inviting you into also. And I am inviting you to our Sexpectations online course. I am so thrilled to be able to offer this. This is our brand new resource, an online digital course to help you actually take the steps to deal with your sexual stuff and find the transformation that Jesus is inviting you into. It's not just information. You got information today. And I know that's been helpful, you know, insights and whatever. And yes, there, there's information in this expectations course as well, but it's more than that. Information by itself rarely changes you. It's the actions that you take that change things. And in this course, you will deal with your sexual story. It's actually doing the steps to deal with your sexual story. In this course, you will experience the transformation that Jesus has to offer. Dealing with your story looks at the past. The transformation Jesus has to offer deals with the present. And you will also write the next chapter of your sexual story with hope. When Jesus comes in, 
he changes the meaning of your story and you are empowered to move forward in a way that you never have been before. And that's what you actually do in this course. Now, if you don't deal with your sexual story in this way, you are a setup for destruction. We have seen countless people in the public view, Christian leaders who have not done this and have fallen as a result. Just a few months ago, an example, Carl Lentz, well-known Hillsong pastor at Hillsong, New York City, left in disgrace because of a sexual affair. Someone else that many of you will know is Robbie Zacharias. Decades of uh, work as a Christian apologist, uh, speaking for the truth of God around the world for decades. Shortly after his death last fall, it quickly became apparent that his behind the scenes life was anything but godly. Multiple sexual problems, indiscretions, and predatory sexual actions harming many women in very destructive ways. I think of uh, someone I know very well who grew up in a Christian home and uh, actually had several marriages and several children with several different men. And then, you know, not even bothering to, to marry the, the rest of the, of the people that, that she was with and was just, when, when, when she talked to me, she was just floored by why do I keep getting hooked up? in these kinds of situations? Why do I keep finding myself in a sexual relationship with somebody I'm not married to and I know it, it's not right? What's, what's the, the issue there? I talk with men and women, husbands and wives, who are just devastated by the intimacy, in uh, the lack of intimacy in their marriage. Those are the kinds of destructive things that will happen if you do not deal with your sexual stuff. But if you do, everything can change. I hear from people all the time who write to me like this, this young man, I'm still struggling with porn and masturbation, but today I had sex with certain woman and this has broken me. I cried knowing I've wronged God and I think my faith is in turmoil. Am I still born again? I wanna die from this shame. I think I've lost my salvation, help me. Or this young woman, I've been a Christian for years, but still struggle with purity and masturbation. I would find victory for a time and then fall back into it. In the last couple of years, I have had my mother pass away, my brother pass away, and just recently my grandmother. All this pain, I seem to revert back to porn to stop the pain. I know the relief is temporary and it leaves me with guilt and has separated me from God. Can you see how these individuals are going to something sexual to deal with matters of the heart. Sex can't fix that. Sex expectations will help you deal with the matters in your heart. So you don't have to keep doing all that. In the sex expectations course, we are right up front to deal with pornography. 75% or so of Christian men and 33% or so of Christian women admit to regularly going to porn. Over 50% of Christian pastors admit to regularly going to porn, huge issue. We deal with that. We also address the issue of multiple sexual partners. That is the brand that, of sexual brokenness that some people uh, address going from, from one to another uh, sexual relationship. We address same-sex attraction. What are the holes in your heart and, and how do you deal with that? And as a, as a Jesus follower, uh, we, we address that. We talk about sexual trauma and oh, what a big deal this is. Statistically about approximately one in four men and one in three women have experienced sexual 
trauma such as you know child abuse or incest or molestation or rape or sexual violence at, in, in some way. But then there's all the rest of the sexual harm as well. I am one of those who believes that we have all been harmed sexually in some way. That may have been, for example, exposure to pornography before you had the mental and emotional wherewithal to know what was going on. It may have been sexualization of a relationship with an older person, a parent, a teacher, a Christian leader. Um, power differentials and just all of, of that of, of that mess. We address the, the sexual trauma portion. The sexual baggage affecting intimacy in marriage. What a huge issue that is. And when both of you, when both husband and wife come to marriage with sexual baggage, oh, what a setup for turmoil and even more trauma. We also deal with the issue of demonic sexual activity. Now, for some of you, that may just seem weird and out there. For some of you, because you have written to me, and I know this, uh, because you've told me you have wrestled and are wrestling with uh, regular demonic sexual activity. It is, uh, it's traumatic, and we talk about all of these things in the Sex Expectations course. This course includes seven modules with video teachings uh, with me. Uh, I, I am there teaching. One of the best parts is we share stories from seven different men and women who have experienced different kinds of sexual brokenness and now are experiencing the transformation of Jesus. You will see them on video. They are sharing their stories on video and you see them uh, talking about all these different areas. Some are married, some are not married. Uh, their, their stories of, of porn or sexual abuse or demonic sexual activity or, you know, brokenness in marriage, not able to have connection uh, with your spouse. This is the stuff in your heart. And they are sharing about the stuff in their heart and the transformation that Jesus brings in this expectations course. It's the actions that you take that make the difference. And we have downloadable worksheets where you can actually do the work to actually help you take the steps to make this a part of your life and move forward. You will get access to an exclusive 40 day prayer challenge. Now, some of you have been part of the Dr. Crown Ministries family in the past and may have in, gotten an email devotional series before. This is different. This is deeper. Yes, there's, there's prayer and there is scripture in these devotionals, but there is also an action step, a very simple and practical action to take each day during this 40 day series to actually do the work. So there's the, the, the worksheets in these modules and also these action steps each day. Sometimes those actions are internal. Sometimes those actions are external uh, to actually make this real. And if you get this expectations course now, beginning next week, beginning on February 23, next Tuesday, you can be part of a series of seven group mentoring coaching calls with me. This is not like a webinar like we're doing right now. And I'm going to do my best to answer a few questions here in a moment. But these group mentoring coaching calls are our Zoom calls where we get to interact more directly. This is not primarily me teaching. That's in the videos. But these group mentoring coaching calls, we address questions. We unpack some of the some of the challenges and actually uh, walk through these steps with you. I am inviting you to get this expectations course now. This can change so much for you. Yoursexpectations.com. If you are watching the replay of this, please check the link under this video or go to yoursexpectations.com. If you're watching this live, you've been able to see uh, the link of where you can go uh, right next to me. I believe yoursexpectations.com. I want you to get this expectations course. Think of your life a year from now. If you don't do anything different than you're doing right now, a year from now, you are still going to be addicted to porn 
or still unable to experience intimacy with your spouse or still struggling with your sexual drives as an unmarried Christian or still no uh, ability to get out of the shame and the hiding that you're behind, your walls are still going to be there. If you deal with your sexual story, come and join us in doing that in Sexpectations. Spend these next six weeks or so dealing with your sexual story, finding the transformation that Jesus has to bring, and then putting the places, putting the steps in your lifestyle to write the next chapter and, and, and do those things over the next year. Imagine what can be different. The shame can be gone. The walls around your heart can come down and you can authentically connect with others. And if you're married, become able to experience intimacy with your spouse. If you're not married, know what that's like. And it, this is not just for married people. In fact, we don't talk primarily about improving sex with your spouse. This is about what's going on in your heart. This is about dealing with your sexual story. And I am asking you to come and join me in Sexpectations and do the work that can change everything. And that is what Jesus is inviting you into. So $79, that gets you uh, lifetime access to the modules and, and, and the worksheets and so on. But I'm inviting you to join now so that you can be part of these seven group uh, mentoring coaching calls with me. Let's walk these through together. I am just going to take a, um, a moment to see if there are some questions um, that I, uh, I would, okay, so some of you are, are, are wanting a book and thank you so much. I will, I will make note of that. But again, you're, you're entered, we'll, um, we'll check that, we'll check that out. Um, Oh, I see one of you said you, you just signed up. Absolutely. Uh, come and join us in Sexpectations. Um, I don't have time to go through every one of the questions that you've submitted, and I want to thank you for, for doing that. Uh, as, as we've been going through the webinar this evening, but I, I, I do see a couple of, of questions that I, I want to comment on, and, and I... Uh, just just for a moment. And that is about the idea of if you are not married or if you're married and your spouse is not uh, open to sex, what do you do with all of this? That may be the most important circumstance in which you need this expectations course. God built within you the need, the desire and the capacity for intimacy. You need intimacy but you can live without sex. Dealing with that is not easy. And I know that, that that statement will be jarring to some people. How do you do that? It's by dealing with these matters in the heart. For those of you who, for example, struggled with porn and got married and thought that would fix you, you know that's not true. Uh, simply getting married is not the answer to these problems in the heart. God has not promised everyone a marriage. He has not promised everyone a sexually fulfilling marriage. So this does not mean that the answer is having a spouse who's sexually responsive to you. That will not deal with the matters in your heart. For some, that is like Lori Creek said, the way that you dem make disciples and demonstrate Jesus. For some, that does not mean marriage. And for some in marriage, the sexual fulfillment may not may not be the answer. I, I just want to emphasize that this is about the matters in your heart, dealing with your sexual story and finding what Jesus has for you, because it is good. It is very good. And empowering you through taking these actions to write the next chapter of your story with hope. That is what Jesus is inviting you into. So come join me in the Sexpectations course. I want to thank you for being part of
this webinar. And if I didn't address your specific question, all of you will be getting an email from me with a link to the replay, and you can respond to that if, if you have additional questions. I look forward to seeing you in this expectations course. And God bless you.